Today's gospel comes from the gospel of Matthew, the fourth chapter, beginning in verse 12, uh, all the way to 22. When Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he left Judea and he returned to Galilee. He went first to Nazareth, then left there and moved to Capernaum, beside the Sea of Galilee in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This fulfilled what God had said through the prophet Isaiah. In the land of Zebulun and of Naphtali, beside the sea beyond the Jordan River, in Galilee where so many Gentiles live, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who lived in the land where death cast its shadow, a light has shined. From then on, Jesus began to preach, Repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon also called Peter and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little farther up the shore, he saw two other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father Zebedee, repairing their nets. And he called them to come too. They immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Dear friends in Christ, in the name of Jesus, our Savior, today I want to talk to you about our calling and following Christ's call upon our lives. If I would ask the question of you, at least before coming to church, how many of you would say, I have a call from God? We tend to think that that's reserved for pastors, and yet the scriptures are filled with God's call upon his people. God calls each of us to a task, and I'm going to explore that a little bit today. I begin with a couple of quotes, one by uh, Studs Terkel. He's uh, left this earth, but he left behind some wisdom. He said this, I think most of us are looking for a calling, not merely a job. Most of us have jobs that are too small for our spirit. Jobs are not big enough for people. We need callings. Elizabeth Dole, who served in Congress, and her husband, who was up to be president of the United States a few years ago, said these words, Life is not just a few years to spend on self-indulgence, career advancements. It's a privilege, a responsibility, a stewardship to be lived according to a much higher calling, God's calling. This alone gives meaning to life. Indeed, it does. Have you found God's calling of your life? I'm going to go on to explain. We actually have various callings, but we are called people. The word actually is, um, in Latin, vacare, it means the work a person is called to do. We each have a vocation before God. We have a vocation that he gives us so that we might serve the world. In the Bible, it starts way at the beginning, starts with the people of Israel. And God says to him, them in Exodus chapter 19, you will be my own special treasure from among all the peoples of the earth. You will be a kingdom of priests, my holy nation. Peter applies that to Christians in the New Testament. This is our call document, you might say. God says through Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 9, you, and you can insert your name, Jack, Susan, Nancy, Steve, you are a chosen people. You are royal priests. You're a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he's called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. 
And people need that light in the world. I don't know about you, it's been awful hard to get up the last few days. Even, you know, coming to preach and stuff, you wake up, it's darkness. And it's like, who's going to shine the light? Well, God calls us to do that. I'm going to talk to you about several calls upon our lives. The first one is the call of the gospel, which produces faith in Jesus Christ. That's the first call in our life. Read the scripture, track the word call or called or chosen. We have a calling by God. It comes in Jesus Christ. Jesus is called the chosen one, the called one of God. And when we're baptized into him, as Owen was today, we're called too. We belong to him. We're called by God's grace in Christ, not by our works, but his work for us. Through the message of Jesus Christ, he reminds us we have a calling. It was very interesting tracking that term called because it didn't say much about what we're called from because the emphasis was on, rather, what we're called to. See, when you have a calling, it's directed for a purpose. Here's what it says some of those purposes are. We're called into Christ's kingdom. We're called to belong to Jesus, to experience his light, his freedom, his peace, his hope. We're called to holiness. This one's interesting. We might want to skip it. We're called to suffering for his sake. But it brings a blessing, an eternal inheritance, eternal life, glory itself. We're called to those marvelous things. So we have a calling, but you might have thought of it more in terms of this, that we have a certain work, an occupation. We want to extend that because a calling involves more. It's our duties before God. Our duties to help other people, myself, I'm a brother, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a grandfather. You might be a wife, mother, grandmother, daughter. You're a citizen of the United States, an employer or employee. You could be a church member here and there's responsibilities there. If I would have started out asking if you had a call, you'd say, no, 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 that's for the pastors. And see, Martin Luther changed that. There is a call to the office of the public ministry. But I'm here to tell you, you are called by God. He has a purpose for you. He put you on earth to be a mother, <laughs> to raise four kids, to be a dad to do the best job you can with what he's placed into your life and the circumstances there. There was a gentleman, he was uh, a very rich grocer. He said this, God doesn't issue a special call to pastors and just leave everyone else uncalled. Every Christian should think of himself as having the divine call for being a Christian witness and making that a full-time career. We'll talk more about that as we go on. We have to learn a little bit more about calling. The marvelous thing of Martin Luther is Martin Luther, you would think he'd say, I have the call. Instead, what he did is he talked about the calling that regular Christians have. It's important. You're members of the priesthood of believers. We each have a task before God. Well, when we look at calling, we've got to look at some other things. We look at the call being external. I've come across some people and they say, I believe I have the call. Pastor's answer, my answer would be, we'll see. God does place that desire in our heart, but the call comes from outside of us. God's call on our life, the call of the church, the call of the organization to which you're part of, but it always comes outside of us. We don't call ourselves. Yes, God uses circumstances. He uses people in our life. He puts a desire in our heart, but he, he works through other people. That's kind of the second point here. 
There's a difference between an immediate call and immediate call. Most people these days have not experienced an immediate call. What's that? It's God coming to you directly. I won't ask, but how many of you this morning woke up and God said, you ought to come to church today? I mean, directly from him. No, we hear his voice. How? We hear it through the scriptures. God provides means by which we might hear his call, hear his shepherd's voice. He does it through the scriptures, but he does it primarily through people. He uses his church to call people to tasks. What's the purpose of a call? It's to serve God by serving people. You say, I'm serving God, and I ask you, well, tell me about the people you're helping. You say, I, I'm not going to get involved with people. You're missing out. Because our call is to love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's to love our neighbors as ourselves. And you say, that's hard. You're right. We need God's guidance. We pray, oh, Lord, direct my task. Lord, what would you have me to do? Oh, God, I'm not sure I can do that. Give me strength to do that. He pours out his Holy Spirit to help you do it and to fulfill your calling. Begs the question, what keeps us from following his call? Unfortunately, many people are in darkness, spiritual darkness. They don't realize who they are. They don't realize who God is in their lives. And they miss out on their calling. For those of us who are Christians, we know our calling. But we still can get busy with life. Our jobs seem to take us away. We can be preoccupied sometimes with our stuff. It could be even family obligations. You know, after all, Pastor, I have my one church day of the month because all those other days i got to be with my family. God says we must obey him rather than people. We are to fulfill our family responsibilities, our obligations there, but we're to lead our children to know the Savior. Really. They end up being the best baseball player or football player or basketball player. And we should cheer that on. But if they miss out on heaven because they're the best at those, they've missed out. Why, why do we not follow God's call? Sometimes fear. We know what we're to do, but we just are afraid. And so the Lord gives us his word, and it's a wonderful passage. The Lord is my light, my salvation, it says. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? For some, they don't fulfill their call because they literally say this to me. I'm nothing. I have nothing to offer. And God says, no, open your eyes. See who I've created you to be even better. See who I've redeemed you to be. I've placed my spirit into your hearts. I call you to do great things. Somebody talking about this said the following. The place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness, your satisfaction, and the world's deep hunger meet. There's a need, and you fill it, and you feel good about it. Well, for sure, we need the Lord's preparation, his empowerment. We can't rely on our own strength to fulfill his call. The issue is not trying harder. What we do for God. Instead, it's what God can do through us. He empowers us for the task. Well, I want to take you to the gospel and mention a few things. The gospel is from Matthew chapter 4. You might want to turn there in your pew Bibles. The first part of it is all about um, the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and it sets the stage. What kind of ticks it off? It starts out, when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he left Judea and returned to Galilee. The tick-off point was the arresting of John. There's some time had passed between verse 11 and 12 in the gospel. 
a year or so, quite some time. Jesus knew that the time was right. Why? John was about to be beheaded. He was going to step off the scene. And kings know that after their forerunner, their herald, their proclaimer exits, they have to step up and show up. And Jesus did. And he didn't quite come to the right place, seemingly. I mean, you wouldn't expect this. He went first to Nazareth. Do you remember Nathaniel? Nathaniel said, can any good come from Nazareth? Really? It's a hick town in the, in the sticks. Let me show you a little bit where it is. There's a map of the north part of Israel. You have the Sea of Galilee on the right. It's a little lake, about 11 by 6 miles or so. On the far left, you have the blue of the Mediterranean Sea. We have the land of Israel there. Now, Jesus... Um, town of birth would not birth uh, he was born in Bethlehem of course he moved shortly after that up to Nazareth and it's just west of the Sea of Galilee he began his ministry at the northern end of the Sea of Galilee around the Sea of Galilee it it looks like this you can maybe see in the picture there's kind of mountains hills quite a bit of uh, of elevation if you walk there you get tired the Dead Sea goes down over a 1,000 feet below sea level, and Jerusalem sits at 2,500 feet above sea level, so 3,500 feet elevation. It's quite a walk. But Jesus comes to this place to fulfill Scripture and to do what else? Here's what it says. It's to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah. In the land of Zebulun, Naphtali, beside the sea, beyond the Jordan River, in Galilee, where so many Gentiles live. I don't know about you, but as I think about a Jewish king, I would think he'd go to Jerusalem. But Jesus spends his time up north. Hint, hint, Jerusalem would reject him someday. So he goes to reach out to Gentiles. Another way of saying it. Christ's purpose in coming was for all. We're having a battle right now. I uh, don't want to make too much of a political statement. But there's struggles about immigration. I'm not saying that everybody should be let in. I think there needs to be caution about that. There needs to be discernment. But one thing I can definitely tell you from Scripture is Jesus invites everybody in to a relationship to himself. And I dare say that that's the attitude that we ought to have. The immigration question is a difficult one, and it's. But as a Christian, non Christians come to you of various faiths. And Jesus wants them to believe as well. What does Jesus say? Our first calling is a calling to repentance. There's the land. Jesus said, he began to preach, repent of your sins, turn to God, the kingdom of heaven is near. It was the same message as John the baptizer back in chapter 3. John leaves, Jesus takes the torch. He marches on, literally he says, keep on repenting. Just as Martin Luther would say years later, the first thesis of the 95 theses, he said this, Our Lord and Master Jesus Christ, when he said repent, desired that the whole life of Christians should be one of repentance. What's repentance? Turning away from our sin, turning to God. It happens in baptism. That's why it's such a special thing we saw what we did today. We die to our sin we rise to newness of life. It's not just that our baptism that happened many years ago, it's to happen every day. Dying to sin, rising to newness of life. Why is that important? Because the king has come. It says, the kingdom of heaven is near. You might have the impression there that it's just saying, well, someday it's going to come. Jesus is saying something much stronger. He's saying the sun has come out, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God has come. What is the kingdom of God? It's the rule of God. The rule of God in the lives of people. 
who experience his peace, who tell others of the joy that you can have. With Jesus coming, the kingdom has come. There is a future element to it, but it's already started. And people can experience it in the church. They really can. They can experience their calling and love and joy and peace. So Jesus calls his first disciples, says this. One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew, throwing a net in the water. They fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, said, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. At once they left their nets, and they followed Jesus. As Jesus was born in a strange place, Bethlehem, as Jesus did his ministry in a Gentile place, Jesus picked among the last people I would pick as disciples. I might pick a senator or something. I wouldn't pick a fisherman. Really? For the king of the universe to come and pick a bunch of fishermen, guys? Well, it would kind of look like this. Maybe some of you love fishing you would have your boats fairly good sized boat 20 some feet long that's what it would have looked like and they used certain nets uh, to do their fishing that's what the net looks like it it wasn't they didn't do uh, they didn't cast a line instead they had this big net and the way I can best describe it so you can understand it was like a parachute they would throw it out, it would come over the fish, and then they'd kind of pull it up and all the fish would be caught in there. That's the kind of fishing that they were doing. Our first calling is to repentance. Our second calling is to discipleship. Jesus called out to them, it says, come follow me. I will show you how to fish for people. Come after me, he literally says, come after me. The question before us is, are you following Jesus in a personal way? Who are you following in your life? Two pairs of disciples, the crowd, follow after Jesus as he teaches, he preaches, he heals. Are we following him too? And if we are, how closely are we following him? For imagery's sake, if Jesus was over at the baptismal font, were you close to him? Or were you, yes, following, but far away? And yet Jesus says to you and me, follow me, follow me. We can tell others, I'm a follower of Jesus. That's not a boast, that's a privilege, for it's Jesus who called us. He said this, you didn't choose me, I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear lasting fruit. What was the fruit? Well, you could say it's changes in character, the fruit of the Spirit. But it's mission. It's mission. We follow Jesus first in a relationship with him. We live in him, and he trains us for mission in the world, for service to others. That's his purpose. The greatest mission field we have is not Africa or Asia or Iran or Iraq. It's across the street. Jesus wants us together to cast the net to the folks across the street. I had a blessing last night. Praise God, I had eyes to see it. Big Jim, who's often here at the 11 o'clock service, the moment I walked in the door, I'm coming down the hallway here, and Jim says, Pastor, I brought two people to church tonight. And I said, great, Jim. You know, hang on just a minute, and then I'll go meet them. And he goes, Pastor, here's so-and-so and so-and-so, and and I brought them to church. And I said, Jim, praise God. And I said to the people, we welcome you. Jesus welcomes you. You're important. Jesus wants us to implement his mission in the world. If we're not fishing for people, something was wrong. Paul Harvey said it beautifully, too many Christians are no longer fishers of people, 
they're keepers of the aquarium. In a few, uh, actually I think it's the end of this week, uh, celebrate the birthday of Dwight Moody. He was an evangelist in Chicago. He wasn't a pastor. He taught Sunday school. While he was walking down a certain street in Chicago, Moody stepped up to a man who was a perfect stranger to him. He just asked him point blank. You can do it this way, but maybe there's better ways. But Moody was pretty bold. Moody said to the man, Sir, are you a Christian? The man replied back to him, Mind your own business. And Moody gave a beautiful reply. Sir, this is my business. It is my business. I'm a fisher for men, fisher for people. I want to conclude this message by uh, going to a bunch of seas. Before I get there, what is our response? How do we follow? As we look at the text, you have Simon and Andrew, or Peter and Andrew, immediately. I mean, they're fishing, and they hear Jesus call, and they drop everything and go to follow him. What does that mean? It means our stuff isn't what's most important. They left their nets. They left their boat. And they followed after Jesus right like that. The other disciples, James and John, were fishing too, or actually preparing their nets. And he calls them. They leave their nets behind. And importantly, they leave their father behind. Remember, one of the things that can keep us from God's call is our family. People may, well, i got to take care of my parents first. That was a very important responsibility in a Jewish world. But Jesus says, follow me first. Maybe God is using you to touch the lives of your mom and dad. Somebody said, when Jesus bids a man come and follow, he bids him come and die. We're to follow Jesus wholeheartedly, with heart, soul, mind, and strength, all that we are. It's radical surrender, giving up all that we have and are. Why? Because he's worth it. He really is, and we got to tell others about it. Here's the C's. First C is commitment. If you want to be a fisher for people, you got to be committed. And you say, Pastor, that's nice for you. That's what pastors do. That's your job. No, I would contend Jesus says all of us together are to be fishers of people. We need everybody. And it starts with commitment. If you don't have a commitment to tell others about Jesus, pray to God, God, give me a heart that cares as much about people as you do. We got this banner up here, hooked on Jesus, it says. Are you hooked on Jesus? Are you committed to him? Well, you say I'm committed, that's great, maybe a little bit, that's good. Pray God warms your heart for more. Next thing is contact. You got to be around people. I'm dealing with people in my life right now that drive me crazy. I just have to say it. I love helping them, but their lives are so complex and messed up that sometimes they don't know where to start. But God calls me to stick with them and to help them because that's his heart. Thirdly, it's conduct. We got we to gotta live the Christian life. Don't let Satan tell you that because you messed up in your past or you have something messed up now that he can't use you. He's a forgiving God. Sometimes our conduct is saying, please forgive me for what I've done, not only to God, but to somebody else. We have a challenge coming up. It's called spiritual simplicity. How many of you need that right now? You feel like life is all over the place. You need a more simple life. Subtitle, doing less and loving more. That's what this is about. Maybe your conduct is to be an inviter. Whether you lead a group or not, maybe you're just to say, you know what, I'm doing a group, come along, join my group. Join this group of John or Susan over here. This is coming up in about a month. Don't miss it. We have conduct. Then I added something. I did this years ago. 
I added community. Because if you look in our epistle, there's another calling too. It's a calling to unity. If we're not unified in our purpose, we're not as fruitful as God wants us to be. Everybody's important. They cast these nets often, not by themselves. They needed others to take the nets and pull them up. If you try on your own, a lot of fish get lost. Jesus calls us together to fish for people. Lastly, communication. We get around people and we got to say something. It's as simple as this. Jesus Christ died for me. And he died for you. Follow after him like I did and have joy and blessing. Don't miss out on his call for you. You want to change life? Jesus will give it. Don't be afraid. The Lord is your light and your salvation. Yes, the Lord has given you a calling, a privilege. You are chosen and part of his family, a calling to live out in the world. Follow your call or calls, but may it be God's call, God's claim upon your life. In his name, amen.